Hi, and welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're doing in this lecture four from week two is talking about atomic absorption spectroscopy. So I've given you the basics about atomic absorption, and now we're going to really be looking at the instrumental side of it. And also we'll be talking really about two different techniques. One is atomic absorption and one is graphite furnace. So in atomic absorption spectroscopy, the simplest way to imagine it is that you're taking a sample it's always got to be a liquid, pretty clean. You're sucking it up in a straw and you're shooting it into a flame. That flame is hot and its main purpose is to actually put the atoms into the gas phase. You still want them to be in their ground state. It can be a very long flame as shown in this picture, so it's not your standard match kind of flame. It actually has a length to it. And then you shine light through the long axis of that flame and you look at the other end and see what is missing. What did that flame absorb? And from that, you deduce something about the elements that are present. So I want to talk to you about acronyms. In instrumental analysis, there's tons of acronyms, and they're not consistent. Some people call atomic absorption spectroscopy AAS. Some call it flame atomic absorption spectroscopy to distinguish it from graphite furnace. Others might say FL AAS. But AAS seems to be pretty common. And so in the reading and the problem sets and the quizzes, I'm going to be using the acronyms because you need to learn what they mean. That's part of the purpose of the class for you. And so just to be clear, the two acronyms that we'll be using are FAAS or AAS. And sometimes you'll see GFAAS or sometimes it's just GFAA. So you'll get some variation. And all of those mean atomic absorption. Remember we talked about last time, absorption different from emission. Now, some factoids about atomic absorption that you can certainly read yourself. First of all, it, it really is a technique that measures a single element. For reasons we'll talk about in a second, it's not an atomic spectroscopy that simultaneously looks at everything on the periodic table. It actually, um, the flames are a really important choice in the design. Typically, you're going to want those flames to be cheap and easy, and so aerosetylene, for example, is a really good option, and I think it gets it up to about 2,000, 2,500 um, Celsius. But the problem is some materials will oxidize. So if you have an iron atom and it's in an air flame, the oxygen can combine with the iron and make an oxide, and that can actually introduce a lot of problems. Maybe it won't go into the gas phase. Maybe it'll have a different absorption spectrum. And so then you're really in trouble. So uh, nitrous oxide is another thing that you can use with acetylene. It's a little bit more expensive, but it changes the flame in important ways. Your samples already said it has to be clean. It can't be cloudy. You have to have done the total digestions we just talked about. And you need a fair bit of sample volume. So how do the spectrometer work? So one of the things that I want to teach you, and we'll do this every time we talk about an instrument, is to say you can't think of it like a black box. Um, you drive your car from point A to B, and probably a lot of us don't know what's really inside of our cars. But when you're using an instrument, it actually is super important that even if you can't see inside of the instrument, you still have to know what are the guts doing. Because in that way, you can make good choices about what instrument to choose. You can troubleshoot problems if you're working with it in the lab. And you can actually understand better how to perhaps improve the instrument if that's something you're interested in. So in atomic absorption spectroscopy, you've really got three important things to do. First you must make a mist of the sample. So you have to take your sample, it's going to be sucked up by a straw, and you have to basically make a mist. If you've ever worked with, I don't know, a mister, a perfume mister, or a spray bottle, it's kind of that, but a little bit more complicated. Um, because you have to turn it into the gas so that it can interact with the flame. Then you have to have a light source that's incident on your atomized sample. And this is a really important part of AAS, because that light source is not generally white light. Most AAS machines are going to have a particular lamp with a particular frequency of electromagnetic radiation, or I should say wavelength of electromagnetic radiation. So rather than shooting a 10,000 10, different energies through your flame, you're just picking one energy, and you're choosing that energy because it's exactly the energy of the element you're interested in. And those are called hollowed cathode lamps, and those are going to be the light sources for most AAS spectroscopy. And that's why it's single element, because you're just looking at one wavelength. Then you have to detect the light after it goes through the flame. Now remember the flame, a long path length, which is the time you travel, means that you can have lower concentrations of atom and, and still see the absorption. That's why you have a long flame. But at the end, you need a detector. You may need a monochromator, depending on your light source, to split all the different energies. Now if you just put one energy through the flame or one wavelength, 
You don't need the monochromator, you can just use a detector. That's one of the advantages of going to a hollowed cathode lamps or what are called elemental lamps, is you don't need the, the tail end of a real deal monochromator to do your analysis. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, you have a detector that when a light hits it, creates a signal, and CCDs are really becoming common, although old school methodologies used to use something called a photomultiplier too. So what I want to do now is go to a website that I suggest you look at, and we'll be using it a fair bit as we go through this class. And it's a website from a school called Concordia that has some really great information and labs on what you do with these instruments. And I like this website because it actually will show you a picture of the AAS. Now, you're going to get um, some videos on atomic emission and ICPMS from me, but this site just has some nice material. Okay, so here we are at Concordia College, it's up in Minnesota, and this is our analytical chemistry lab, and they have a nice online manual. So what you can see here is the discussion of atomic absorption spectroscopy, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, here's a really, really good experimental diagram of a system that's kind of boiled down to the basics. You can see there's a light source, again, that could be white light or a hollow cathode lamp. There's a flame that's got a long path length. In this case, they're using just acetylene and air, and that's not surprising. In a teaching lab, you're not going to want the more expensive gases. And you can see they have a monochromator and a detector. And one of the other things they have here that I really like is here's what the instrument actually looks like. <laughs> so these things are, you know, kind of the size of, I don't know, really, really large kitchen equipment. And you can see the sample in the Erlenmeyer down here. It gets sucked up by a straw that gets then pulled into a flame where you just make those ground state atoms. And notice how long the flame is and how it's organized so the light goes a long ways through it. Over on the right, you can see the hollow cathode lamps, and you can switch between them. So each of the lamps is designed for a particular element. And as you can read about on this page, the reason they shine at a certain wavelength is because that element is inside of it. So for example, this lamp here is a copper lamp, and it's really good because it's emitting the wavelengths that copper atoms absorb. So you can only really use one HCl lamp at a time. And so when you buy an atomic absorption spectrometer, you then outfit it with a series of lamps. And those basically define what elements you can measure. The other drag about an AA machine is actually the Erlenmeyer, the sample. You need a lot of volume. Um, you sort of suck it through. It makes a big sort of sound when it's running. It's a very noisy instrument. And you sometimes have to average and take the sample through, this, through the flame for a while. So it's not just like taking a picture of the flame. So I encourage you to look at that website. But meanwhile, a couple of the basics just to highlight. Light sources in an AAS are going to be generally single element sources. Hollowed cathode lamps are the most popular, and they actually are defined by the elements. You buy one for copper or you buy one for zinc. And then you have to think about the flame and the flame temperature and whether it's a reducing or oxidizing flame. Aracetylene is going to be a real good standard, but it could lead to some problems with metals that are easily oxidized. Then you need to also think about the detector, whether you need a monochromator or don't need a monochromator. Um, those are all of the elements. And what I show you here is some diagrams. You can see here a hollow cathode lamp, which has basically a cup of the metal that you want to detect. And because it's at, uh, you put a voltage across it, you actually get a vapor that gets generated. And that's actually emitting light that you're using as your light source. And at the bottom is actually just a nebulizer, which is, as I said, the fancy spray bottle. But you can see that it looks a lot more complicated than that. Um, nebulizers are a really important technology because you need to put things into the gas phase. And one of the disadvantages when you don't have a good nebulizer is that you may be sucking up 50 mils of sample. But at the end of the day, how many of those atoms made it into the flame in a vapor phase in their ground state? And the nebulizer really controls what's called that sampling efficiency. If that sampling efficiency is poor, you have to go through a lot of material, a lot of sample, in order to detect it. So new nebulizer designs are a really um, important research goal for a lot of work in atomic spectroscopy. I want to briefly mention graphite furnace. AAS. It's a functionally really different tool, and in your reading this week, you're going to be introduced to why that is. The Perkin-Elmer discussion, I believe, has probably the best discussion and description. But to make a long story short, rather than sucking up water into a flame, what you do is you use a little tiny tube, and it's made of graphite because it's the cleanest thing you can find that doesn't contaminate anything. You're going to put just a little tiny droplet of your sample in it, and you're going to heat it up. And by the droplet, it might be only 10 microliters, 100 microliters, much, much less than the 50 mil you may need to suck through a normal flame AAS. So graphite furnace, you simply heat it up in this tube, and you make a vapor. 
you can you can strain it so you vaporize your sample and then the light goes through it and you detect it in the exact same way as you would detect a flame AAS and often the instruments are sold together because the detection side is identical in both cases what's different is how you're exciting the samples into the gas phase and what whether you need and, and the nature of your light source so in both cases graphite furnace and flame AAS you'll often use the same single element lights um, in graphite furnace though sometimes you need to sample for a longer time because you can have lower concentrations of material depending on the vapor pressures that you're operating at often these graphite um, tubes will go to 3000 degrees for example which is enough to vaporize many things but other other things may just are refractory and they never ever volatilize and that's why the number of elements you can analyze with graphite furnace is reduced maybe only 30 to 40 as compared to flame AAS which can do about 70 so I want to summarize what I've told you about AAS and GF AAS atomic absorption spectroscopy and graphite furnace atomic absorption spectroscopy also known as GAAS by some people what you see here are two simple diagrams and these are actually drawn from your reading one of the things that you're going to be doing as we go through is I'm going to be providing you reading materials and I don't really want to bury you in hundreds of paper pages of reading but at the same time I want to give you concise and interesting information and one of the best ways to do that is to actually rely on the manuals from companies that make these instruments they can often be very brief and very informative although they kind of have some salesman quality but the other really big advantage for this class is they're free so I can provide them to you and not worry about issues such as copyright believe me those companies would love to get this material in front of you and it is pretty accurate information so I want to briefly take you to um, one of those reading materials for this week okay so let's do a little bit of a tour of the two most critical pieces of reading for this week they're both posted on the page, both under resources and linked to this lecture and future lectures. So they're from two companies that sell a lot of atomic absorption spectrometers to people all over the world. One of them is Perkin Elmer and one of them is Thermo. So in this particular write-up, um, it's from Perkin Elmer. I actually really like this write-up. Uh, again, lots of pretty pictures. Um, but what I really like about it is it gives really, really simple discussions of the spectrometer. And you can see this very nice um, sort of simplified drawing of a flame AA system. And then if you go down, it starts talking about graphite furnace. And it gives you a sense of why one would do graphite furnace analysis as opposed to AA. And again, a very simplified diagram. What's really interesting in terms of this kind of analysis is it also goes on to talk about ICP AES and ICP MS. And then it actually compares all of the techniques. One of the important things we'll be doing in this particular week is talking about choosing one spectroscopy over another. So these manuals become in real handy in terms of comparing and contrasting. So that's the Perkin Elmer one. So I also include one from Thermo, just because I think it's important that you not feel that I'm pushing any brand. I, I use all of these brands. I think they're great. These are just the ones that have particularly good manuals that I think are well pitched to the sort of 10 to 15 page limit I was lo looking for. Thermos is also a very good manual. It covers much of the same material. It has a nice set of definitions. Uh, so when I'm using terminology and lecture you're confused about, make sure you check the reading because I may be actually linking to the reading in some fashion and I might have forgotten to say anything about it. But just like the other one, you get some very nice simplified diagrams and a nice discussion of the strengths. So I hope that little tour of the reading was motivating for you. And don't be afraid of those reading materials. They're relatively short and pretty easy to understand. And they're going to be really crucial for you to learn this material. A lot of understanding instruments is simply accruing a lot of facts and knowing how they all sort of mash together to make up an understanding of what an instrument can and cannot do. Thanks so much. See you next time.